G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel today, taking a look at the Fremantle Football Club in particular. Obviously, they're a team on the rise, probably one of the surprise packets to some so far in 2022. They currently sit 5-1 with just the one loss this year against St Kilda and a second on the AFL ladder. So it kind of inspired this little video here where I thought I'd take a look at their, their rebuild. It's been going on for a little while now since the end of uh, 2015, early 2016 was the time they decided to really gut the list. And now where it appears that they may be on the verge of really rising up the ladder, it's time to take a look at just how successful this little rebuild period for them has been. Now while they sit 5-1, obviously it still remains to be seen whether they are a realistic shot at uh, even finals, let alone top four, but there has been some conversation this week as to how far can they go, and that's why I thought it'd be a good time to unpack the rebuild over the last six years. It's been one of the more comprehensive rebuilds when you consider just how much of that list was turned over in that period of time, and frankly, how long the rebuild seems to be dragged on as well. So we're going to go through all of that and perhaps some of the reasons why it's gone so slowly. Personally, I probably have Fremantle as maybe the sixth or seventh best side in the competition right now. We've still got a lot to learn. It's been a relatively easy draw, but there's been no doubt that they've certainly improved. They've got some really, really nice aspects to their game. It'll be intriguing to see how far they can hold that this year and whether they can really push to go deep in September. So the backstory of their rebuild was that at the end of the 2015 season, Fremont had won the minor premiership, but been knocked out of a home prelim final against the eventual premiers Hawthorne. And while they had an aging list, they still had, you know, Nat Five, the best player in the competition on their team at the time. And it didn't really appear obvious that the cliff was coming as uh, as close and dramatic as it did. But they would start 2016 0-8 from memory. And by that point, it was really obvious that the clear direction for Fremantle was to completely gut the list and bring in some young talent. So that's been a fair stretch now. That was six seasons ago. Between that 2016 and 2020 era, they've sort of been rebuilding and in quite a slow fashion. When you look at their win-loss record, they've actually only improved. Between that 2017 period to 2021, they actually improved their win-loss ratio by just two wins. So on the outside looking in, you look at that and think that is a very, very slow rebuild. Are they doing it correctly? But in this video, I sort of want to get into maybe some of the reasons why that has happened so slowly. And I guess the first part of it is that over that period they have completely re-imaged their list. Similar to how I've been banging on about West Coast uh, in this particular week about rebuilding and not investing in the draft, Fremantle had kind of come off a period there where they're competing for grand finals or getting close to where they'd sort of ignored the draft. They certainly weren't giving a lot of exposure to young players and that was a bit of a criticism of Ross Lyon, not just at Fremantle but at St Kilda as well. So for them, in order to rebuild the list, they really had to start from scratch. Another factor is that uh, as an Eagles fan, I'll admit that I think Fremantle has been surely one of the most injury hit teams of the last five years or so. And it seems to be key players missing large chunks of the season. Throughout that last little rebuilding era, I'd probably say, you know, Nat Fife is clearly their best player. Then you know, guys like Alex Pierce and, and to a lesser extent, Joel Hamling have been in incredibly important for them and have missed a lot of football. So the fact that they probably didn't have a lot of young talent to start with in this rebuilding period and then, you know, having injuries to some of their best star players throughout that period only compounded the situation they were in and of course they, they sustained some heavy losses and didn't really get close to finals throughout that whole period. Another huge factor in this is that they have undoubtedly paid the price for rebuilding and I've had this belief that, you know, in the modern game with so much player movement, the longer you've rebuilt, particularly as an interstate side, the ability to retain your young talent, particularly if it's Victorian, and that's where a lot of the draft talent obviously comes from. Victoria, it's a huge draft talent pool. The longer you rebuild and go through seasons just winning eight games and sustain heavy losses, it becomes harder to sell a future to your young players. So throughout this period of rebuilding, Fremantle have lost a lot of players that they would have liked to have kept. Some of the players that they've lost to trade requests interstate have been Lockie Neal, Jesse Hogan, Lockie Weller, Ed Langdon, Hayden Crozier, Adam Chera, Brad Hill, and Harley Ballack. Now, the irony is some of those players were actually traded in during this rebuilding era, including Jesse Hogan and Brad Hill, but of course, didn't want to stick around. But when you look at that list of players there, with the exception of maybe Crozier and Harley Ballack, those are all absolutely best 22 quality players. So for them, it's really been hard to construct and maintain a team. As a result, they're still the fifth youngest team in the competition despite rebuilding for so long. And perhaps that average is even bumped up by the fact that they have the oldest player in the competition, David Mundy, who turns 37 this year, I think. They have just the four players over 
over 30 years old and a staggering 17 players on their list under the age of 21. And a whole heap of that under 21 group is actually either in their best 22 or close to it. So with all that in mind, that's not a real surprise why this rebuild process has taken so long for Fremantle. But we can take a closer look at their recruiting over the last five or six years, starting back in 2016, where they absolutely nailed the draft in my opinion, all the way through 2021. And we can get a little glimpse of the, the talent that they've assembled in the last five years or so. So they really kickstarted their rebuild in 2016 in the best way possible. They've recruited Griffin Logue in the first round, then added Sean Darcy, Brendan Cox, and Luke Ryan later in the draft as well. And in particular, I've heard Fremantle fans argue that, you know, Sean Darcy and Luke Ryan are probably two of their best three players, if not the top two players on their list at the moment. Brendan Cox is absolutely a best 22 player, and Griffin Logue, while he lost his spot recently, is looking like a very serviceable defender as well. In 2017, they had two top five picks because they traded away Lockie Weller, and they picked up Andy Brayshaw which turned out to be a fantastic move for them, both in hindsight and at the time as well. Of course, Chera went pick five. They later flipped him for Jai Amos, and Switkowski was also picked up at the back end of that draft as well. 2018 was an interesting off-season for Fremantle. They turned the loss of Lockie Neal going to Brisbane into the relatively high-profile recruits of some West Australian tall talent in Jesse Hogan and Rory Lobb, and these guys look like they might just fill the voids in Fremantle's forward line that they so desperately had. They managed to keep a first-rounder as well and add Sam Sturt through the draft who hasn't quite currently made his name at AFL level but he looks like a reasonable talent to me. 2019 might have been another year where they struck gold. Hayden Young looks like a terrific halfback flanker. Caleb Sarong won the rising star as an inside midfielder and Liam Henry is a very talented sort of wingman forward as well. Throughout the 2020 and 2021 drafts which were both COVID affected when you consider how much football young talent missed those years particularly from Victoria they went through a very West Australian focus and picked up Heath Chapman, O'Driscoll, Brandon Walker, plus traded in Blake Akers in 2020. And in 2021, they added Amos, Erasmus, Johnson, and traded in Will Brody as well. So on the whole there, looking at the recruits that they've picked up, it appears to be shrewd drafting for mine. Obviously in the last couple of years, it's harder to assess how some of these younger talents will go, but you have to really like the look of Neil Erasmus, Nathan O'Driscoll, in particular, Heath Chapman looks like he could be an A-grade medium defender at AFL level. There were some other bit players they picked up from other clubs like James Aish and Travis Collier, but I, I couldn't fit them all on the graphic. So with that recruiting in mind, and I would argue that that is a very, very solid period of recruiting with high picks, let's maybe take a look at how their best 22 stacks up. Their back line, I would argue, is a relative strength. I think they've got some sound key defenders in Alex Pierce in particular. I know he's injury prone, but he's a very, very good one-on-one -on -one defender with Brennan Cox is really turning into a handy player as well and Griffin Logue developing nicely as a sort of third tall, perhaps. You'd have to say Luke Ryan is the crown jewel of that defense. As I said, some Fremantle fans consider him their best player. He's kind of an undersized key defender at times, but he's also a very good interceptor and one of the better kicks on their team as well. There's also a huge amount of upside in their run and carry. Hayden Young is, like I said, probably one of the best medium defender talents in the league right now. Great intercept player, uses the ball well, makes really smart decisions. Heath Chapman, like I touched on, Brandon Walker, and they've of course recruited Jordan Clark as well. So there's a good balance there of defensive nous and some genuine rebound now. And you can see that as a feature of their game this year, their ability to run and spread from halfback has been a real feature. You have to say their midfield is another relative strength. Sean Darcy is one of the best rucks, let alone young rucks in the competition right now, making the All-Australian squad last year. We know about Fife and Mundy and the players that they can be, but in particular, the younger midfielders in Andy Brayshaw and Caleb Sarong, like I touched on before, they appear to be locked in A graders from my opinion. They're both playing well beyond their years. Andy Brayshaw could be and should be an All-Australian this year, you'd think. And like I said, Caleb Sarong won the Rising Star as well. So that's two premium midfield talents that have gone on their list, who in theory haven't actually hit their peak yet. We do know Chera was a key cog in this particular rebuild, but despite his absence, they've managed to add in a young midfielder, Will Brody, who wasn't having a, a great time at the Gold Coast Suns and has come in and looked every bit a best 22 midfielder for them this year. Blake Akers and Darcy Tucker are okay players, but I think over time they prefer to see the young midfielders in the wings like O'Driscoll, Neil Erasmus, and perhaps Matthew Johnson as well come in and take their spots in the best 22. The only real question mark on this midfield is the fact that it's just very young still. So while I do think they do have the ingredients there to become a top line midfield one day, there will still need to be some patience as these players mature and hit their peak. Now let's talk about the glaring weakness in my opinion of Fremantle's list and it's a question mark that unfortunately the rebuild has still yet to answer. It's been a problem since the retirement of Pavlich, to be honest. No one has kicked more than 40 goals in a season since 2015. Walters has been their leading goal kicker four times out of the last six years, and the last two years were both Tabena as well. And that's the first time a genuine key forward has been their leading goal kicker since Pavlich, depending on how you rate Cam McCarthy. 
Unfortunately, it's just a part of the ground they haven't been able to find a permanent answer to. They dabbled and failed with Cam McCarthy for a variety of reasons. Tapena has been inconsistent, but at times has been a very good player as well. But around him as well, Hogan came in and bounced about back to GWS. And Rory Lobwell, he's a serviceable player. He's not that permanent mainstay key forward that he looked like he might be when he's at GWS. It hasn't quite worked out for him in that position. And of course, there's every chance that he goes to GWS in this year's trade period as well. Like I said, Tapena is a solid player. He's not bad at all, but at 28, they probably need a bit more of a younger option to make that transition going forward. And I think he just needs more support, even if he's in the side. Nat Fife is another player that they've trialed as a permanent key forward. And while he may do a lot of good things in terms of actually producing goals, it's never really been a strength for him. He actually hasn't averaged more than a goal a game since the 2016 season and has only done it twice in his entire career. What they do have going for them in their forward line is a great set of smalls. I talked about Schultz and Switkowski, who is potentially the next Walters Ballantyne combo in that forward line. They're both really, really good players, in particular Schultz. Both of them can run through the midfield to some extent as well and impact. The only question mark I have on them is, again, they don't really produce a lot of goals. This is the part of the ground there. The cupboard is a little bit bare for me. They do have some promising young players in Josh Tracy, Jai Amos, and Sam Sturt, who are all playing in the waffle currently. And there's every chance these guys come on and become very, very good players, but they're three players that Fremantle sort of need to bank on to some extent. So, in summary, with that all considered, where do Fremantle sit in the rankings? As I said, probably as I see it right now on form they're probably maybe the sixth or seventh best side in the competition. For me, it's still Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, then maybe a gap to Geelong and St Kilda. Then you can sort of argue Fremantle have been better than the Western Bulldogs this year, but are we at the point where we're ready to relegate the Western Bulldogs down just yet? It's a matter of opinion. What Fremantle do have on the side is that they are still a very young team with plenty of time to gel and mature under a new coach in Justin Longmuir. There's a lot of high draft picks in that side as well with a heap of upside. And personally, I don't think their premiership window's here yet, but but in two years, it could well open up. My fear for Fremantle is they don't quite plug the holes in their forward line and don't find enough reliable avenues to goal that their window may never really come. But they currently sit 5-1 and with a bit more success and a future to sell to these young players, I'd imagine their retention will get better too, which will hopefully expedite the rest of the rebuild process. But anyway, guys, let me know what you think of where Fremantle's at. I hope this video has perhaps given a little bit of insight as to, you know, how long this Fremantle process has been going for and what are some of the factors that it hasn't happened quicker. But what do you think? How do you rate their best 22? How do you rate their high draft pick talents? How far can they go this year? And when will their premiership window open if it isn't now? Hope you're enjoying the content, guys. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.